Mark Caseboat, one of our very own, very talented volunteers, who will speak to us on the subject of sailors not tying, its history, and its elevation to an art form. Uh, he told me that uh, he started tying knots when he was about 12 years old as part of his general interest in folk art. And in doing so, he found the beauty and the symmetry of well-executed Marlin Spike seamanship captivating. Now that he is retired, he has de dedicated himself to the art, and you can see the results of his dedication throughout the museum. You passed it as you came up the stairs. So help me give me a uh, help me give Mark a very warm welcome. It's all yours. Thanks. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, well thanks for Coming out, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Eh? Um, so I'm here to talk to you about knots, and uh, you might ask yourself why. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, it's 2019. We have Home Depot. Do we need to tie knots? <clears throat> we have nails. We have nail guns. We have screws, bolts of all kinds, eye bolts, lag bolts, anchor bolts. We have chains steel cables, all kinds of adhesives, tape, twist ties, rubber bands, bungee cords, catches, latches, turnbuckles, wire ties, clips, vice grips, brackets, pegboard, shrink wrap, heat shrink, magnets, and staples. We can weld, solder, crimp, swage, clamp, pin, tap, and thread. We have buttons, buckles, zippers, clasps, snaps, and Velcro. <laughs> We even have action figures with kung fu grip. Right? <laughs> so all of that, why do we need to talk about knots? So that concludes my talk on knots. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. oh you, I've got some more here if you want to hear it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, <laughs> for some reason, people like that. Uh, so, oh, look what I forgot to do. That should have been there while I said all that, okay? <laughs> yeah, here we go. Forgot about this thing. Uh, okay, so a little bit of my history. Um, uh, we just heard a little Jerry just mention a little bit of it. About 50 years ago, I pulled off the shelf at my house this book, which is the Ashley Book of Knots, which we also have in the library. And it's a nice big book, and there's a lot in it. I mean, a lot. Uh, so just one look at that book, and I would just, uh, it just got me. I don't know, the, uh, Ashley's um, illustrations and, and explanations and stuff, it just, it just captured my attention. I just had to have it. So that book disappeared into my bedroom, never to return, where I set up a uh, small bench and started to devise and collect tools and stuff and, and materials and everything I could find to try and make something that looked like the diagrams in, the, uh, in Ashley. But living a long way from the ocean, I lived, you know, 60 miles, I don't know, probably 90 miles inland. And uh, so, you know, at that time, the interwebs were just a, you know, a dream, you know, it was science fiction. So I had no way of finding any sort of examples. Nothing three-dimensional I could put my hands on, you know, or, or anything. I didn't know what materials to use, didn't know, you know, anything. So it was a long process trying to get, you know, figure out what I was doing. And it's not an easy hobby, uh, especially then. And it's not particularly easy now. Some of you know this. Uh, and it's made harder because the nomenclature in a lot of these cases is a little bit odd. Uh, knots are found by a lot of different names. Some of them are descriptive, like the bosun's lanyard knot or the man rope knot. And some are just odd, like the baggy wrinkle or <laughs> the ever popular monkey's fist. Uh, many knots are called by different names, depending on how they're tied and what they're used for. 
The uh, boson's lanyard knot that I just mentioned is also found as the sailor's lanyard knot, the marlin spike lanyard knot, or a boson's whistle knot, depending on its use. But it's also known as a single strand diamond knot and a double strand diamond knot, just to avoid confusion, I think. <laughs> uh, for another example of odd and different names, how many of you could come up here right now and demonstrate to us how to tie a uh, double slipped reef knot? But, <laughs> what? Because he knows how to tie his shoes, right? I'm sure you all know how to tie your shoes, right? That was a trick question. This is a trick question. <laughs> These two right here in the front got it. I know that. <laughs> David and Vicky got it. So today there's a lot of information on the interwebs uh, that uh, you know can, you can learn knot tying, and there's a lot of good stuff if you're willing to, you know, plow through it and pick out the gems. Whether you use cheap uh, clothesline or high quality hemp, you know, you can make lots of stuff, lots of beautiful things that can either, will either amaze your friends or bore them to death. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> so, uh, I want to talk about a little history. Wait a second. There it is. History. <laughs> so mainly what I want to think about is, is how ancient is knot tying? When did knot tying, where does it fit in human technology? And I'm using the word human really loosely here because I'm basically talking about anybody walking around on two legs during these time periods. I'm talking about everything, all the dates here I'm giving you are very loose, so doesn't, you know, but it's not important. Uh, also, what we think about as technology today is different than what was thought about, you know, a long time ago. Now you carry this technology around in your pocket, but in those days, technology was anything that made their lives better, right? Use one thing for a different purpose. And the first technology was probably just a stick, right? Probably just bashing something, poking something, prying, doing whatever, prodding something with a stick. Uh, this got better and better over time, but they can't put a date on it because there's sticks all rot away. Can't, there's no sticks that are found that you can put a date on. Uh, about 3.3 million years ago, uh, stone tools came into use. Uh, these are the first examples of stone tools were found that they know about. And stone tools must have greatly improved the quality of life. Again, you can bash stuff with it, and as they uh, improve the materials and the methods, <clears throat> you uh, got better edges and, and they became more useful. Uh, but as far as I know, right now, at this point, they're all handheld. So we're not really talking about knots yet. Uh, at about 1.5 million years ago, uh, we learned how to tame fire for our use. So that's two million years, almost two million years between the first stone tools and fire. So things moved slow in those days. <laughs> so now we have a bunch of naked people sitting around a fire banging rocks together, which could be fun, right? All right. Uh, now about 500,000 years ago, two innovations happened at about the same time. Uh, one was the first known use of stone-tipped spears, and the other is the first known evidence of people wearing clothing. Uh, these two things both imply cordage and knots. So we're at 500,000 years ago, and we're getting stone-tipped spears. Now, the... Uh, things like animal hide, uh, plant material, the sticks, you know, the, the, the shafts that the uh, tips would have been put on. Of course, it's all gone to rot and it's rotted away over the millennia, but the uh, stones are still there and they can tell a lot from them, uh, including they can see where little notches have been cut in them uh, so that it could be tied to the end of the stick, right? So now we have hard evidence of knots being tied. 500,000 years ago. But it's not hard to kind of picture that between 
one point, well, no, 3.3 million years and 500,000 years, so th almost 3 million years, probably people were tying knots. There's no evidence of it. There's no hard evidence of it. But as soon as fire came in, especially, now that you're starting to gather wood and stuff like that, you probably wound up something around in a vine or something like this. And don't forget the stone tip spears were probably put on, the, the, the stones were put on, probably with animal hide or something like that, wrapped around. And of course, they would have had to devise some sort of knot so it wouldn't unravel. So we got hard evidence of knots at this point. And clothing, of course, uh, seems pretty obvious. Probably uh, uh, animal hides tied together, sewn together. Can everybody read that? No. It says, in case you haven't heard, we live in caves now and wear clothes. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> so, so there's that. So we're, we're solidly into tying knots. Uh, here we are. About 400,000 years ago, it was the first shelters, the first evidence of shel people building shelters. These were poles that were stuck in the ground and then brought together at the top and tied and then covered with something or other. They found in France, I believe, evidence of this in some clay where all the holes were around in a circle and uh, they put it all together. There was evidence of a civilization there or, a, or a, uh, something, whatever it was. Uh, the first known evidence of weaving uh, came in about 30 to 36,000 years ago. Uh, flax fibers were found that were twisted together and dyed several colors. And they dated them to 30 to 36,000 years. And what is weaving except the made, making of a big, giant, you know, very complex knot, right? And they would have had to use, they had cord now, they, had, they were pretty sophisticated with it. So just to flesh out our collective history, uh, uh, we developed agriculture about 23,000 years ago. The wheel came in at about 5,500 years ago. The Copper Age began around 5,000 years ago. Okay. So when you think about the speed of technology then versus now, it's really nuts. Uh, but it's easy to see that cordage and knot tying and all this sort of stuff would have happened very early on in our history. It's one of our very first technologies. It is something that's absolutely important and basic to our, you know, uh, development as, you know, a species. Now, the earliest known boats with sails date to about 7,500 years ago. Uh, they found some little painted discs. Uh, that had that showed reed boats with a single square mast on a or a single square sail on a mast, and so that was 7,500 years ago. Somewhere along the line, somebody made the discovery that if you twist the fibers together, they became stronger. Uh, the reason for that is that. If you just lay the fibers out straight and pull on them, you're pulling on each one individually. But if you twist them and pull, it actually binds them together and, and they all work as one. Oh, I left out that. Let's go back here. <laughs> uh, where is it? Oh yeah, this was 135,000 years ago. Neanderthals made this piece of jewelry. That's 135,000 years. There are little notches and stuff in it which indicate that these things were tied together. So now, at this point, we have knots going from just practical to also decorative. Sorry about that. I left it out. So now, a quick look at this picture. You can just see coils of rope, right? Looks like modern rope. Three strands twisted together. Doesn't look any different than what you could buy at the store. But what you're looking at is a cave, is a picture of a cave in Egypt. That rope is made of papyrus and is, it dates to 3,500 years ago. BC. 3,500 years ago. 
So what you're looking at here is modern rope. Uh, the methods of making rope haven't changed for, you know, for through 3,500 years, probably 4,000 years. Right? They've been making rope just like that. Now, materials have improved, and uh, you know, probably you know, manufacturing methods, obviously. But it's this is how far you know how important this was. This developed very early on, and uh, and they still made rope like they still make it today, and it didn't never change until about 1930 when nylon was invented and other synthetic fibers, which made. Uh, more modern uh, braided ropes possible. Excuse me. So, uh, and that's history. I'm done with a history lesson. So today, knots are important in a lot of hobbies, a lot of stuff. Uh, I occasionally do things, you know, uh, set up, up, especially up here, a little table and do knots for different events that go on here, like Art Comes Alive and stuff like that. And invariably I get a dozen guys that come up and say, oh yeah, I learned that in, in you know, Boy Scouts or learned how to do this and that. And they want to tell me all about it. And I can't remember any of it, which is fine. And it's terrific that, you know, knots are still being tied and, and that that's, you know, something that kids are learning. I think everybody should know a few basic knots for an emergency. Uh, here's a guy that knows a few basic knots, I'll bet. <coughs> probably fairly confident in his ability to tie certain knots, right? And probably hoping like heck that the guy above him also knows how to tie a knot or two. Uh, there's a lot, lot being risked there. And we've all seen this guy trimming the trees and stuff. Another person, you know, modern person using ropes. There aren't a lot of... Uh, uh, industries that use a lot of rope, but uh, they're out there. But no group came close to developing knots like the early sailors. And now we're finally, finally where we need to be. Early sailors, okay. Um, so not, knots were very important to sailors in the days of the wooden ships. Perhaps you can find a clue as to why in that picture. <laughs> right? Uh, remember, every one of those lines is terminated with a knot of some sort. And when I say knot, I'm using very, that very general sense because it could be splices. There's a number of ways to attach uh, ropes of things. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of technical words, but, uh, but they're all tied one way or another. So imagine, you know, spending every waking minute of your day for months or even years on end surrounded by rope. You know, it's coming at you from all directions, the whole voyage, you know, you're just surrounded. You sleep in a, in a hammock made of old canvas and uh, rope. So the sailors are the ones that developed the knots, but who were they? Let's take a look at who the sailors were. Uh, Here's one. So were they bloodthirsty mutineers and eye patches? This guy lost his parrot. Uh, other than that, he's got everything, I think. Well, actually, I meant, you know, maybe, maybe. But more likely, uh, not quite so exciting. Uh, I mentioned the Ashley Book of Knots earlier. <clears throat> a fantastic book. I, you should really take a look at it if you're interested in this at all. Here's a quote from Ashley uh, talking about sailors. It says, at the beginning of the 19th century, it was unusual to find in the forecastle of a sailing ship more than one or two sailors who could read and write. It was a common thing for boys to go to sea before they were 10 years old. And cabin boys of seven and eight years of age were not unusual. So, I like this picture because you see these two kids right up front. And I don't know, how old do you think that kid with the dog is? 12, 10. I was thinking 10 or 12, right? And the kid on the other side of the, of the life, uh, whatever, is not much older. But what's interesting to me about this picture, uh, 
besides their age, is also the looks on their faces. They're not nervous about this. They're not nervous like me standing up here in front of all of you. <laughs> there's a confidence there, right? This is probably not their first voyage. I, I just I think that's just an amazing picture. And of course, they got a dog and a cat. And we got you see the cat over here. It's <laughs> so cute. <laughs> So his first voyage, you know, was probably his first time away from home, right? On a ship full of strangers, right? And doing, expected to do work that he has no idea how to do, has no concept of what's going on around him. Imagine that. That'd be scary as heck, wouldn't it? But what are your options, you know, in those days? I'm talking, you know, 1700s, 18, early 1800s. What are your options? You know, if your father pushed a dung cart, chances are you were going to push a dung cart, right? Unless your brother, you had an older brother who had dibs on the dung cart, then what are you going to do? <laughs> right? So perhaps the idea of going to sea wasn't such a bad idea. Uh, sailors were drawn from the lower classes. Uh, I'm talking about the common sailors, not the officers, obviously. And going to sea provided a career of sorts, adventure, see the world, all that sort of thing. So it was, it was a good gig, potentially. It was, they had a rough life, but it was, you know, if you made it as, as an able-bodied seaman, you were really doing something. Now, since most sailors were illiterate, there were no books written about basic seamanship until probably about the middle of the 18th century. Uh, those books were written for new officers who, of course, were educated and could read. Uh, and they were so that the new young officers would be able to go on a ship and not be completely blindsided by what the heck they were looking at. Right? So there wasn't a lot of, there was virtually no instruction on knot tying, but they talked about the parts of the ship and stuff. Uh, we can talk about more of that later. So for the ordinary sailor, for those kids or anybody else, the only there's only one place to learn the art of, of sailing, and that is on a ship from a more experienced sailor. <laughs> Sometimes that worked out better than others, I imagine. So the only way to learn is by watching. Uh, so able-bodied seamen were highly skilled workers with a unique set of skills that they needed to maintain the ship. Uh, ship's crews were a mixed bag of race, nationality, where only the only thing that mattered was skill and competence. It was absolutely a mixed bag of nationalities. These guys don't necessarily even all speak the same language, but they know the ship. And they can they can pull it off. So, so they have to figure it out from each other. So why were knots important? Well, uh, besides the obvious reasons, right? Again, an Ashley quote. I have a few of these. Uh, it's from the uh, Ashley Book of Knots. It says, "On a full rigged ship, in everyday use, are several miles of rigging." And an able-bodied seaman, of necessity, is acquainted with every inch of this extent. So, that's a lot. It's a lot going on. And so, a sailor spent much of his time up in the rigging, right? Going over the sails, going over every line, constantly looking and improving stuff. So, you know, I mean, how hard could it be? So each line had a purpose and a name, and uh, so that's a lot of names, a lot of purposes, a lot of stuff going on. And sailors, like many professionals, develop their own special terminology, and that includes knot tying. An example of that is the fact that a knot is almost never tied. You don't tie knots. For instance, a, a splice is put in, a hitch is made, or, uh, is made fast or taken. Two ropes are bent together. 
A knot is put in, made, or cast in a rope. A sailor takes a turn, he belays, he claps on a stopper, he slacks away, casts off a line, he clears a tangle, opens a jam knot, he works a Turk's head or a senate, but the word tie is rarely used. Uh, huh? Oh, okay. Throw a bowling? Well, yeah, there's a lot. There's a, there's a whole bunch. You want them all? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Thanks. We're going to be here a little longer than you thought. So anyways, the word tie is kind of a general term uh, when something specific is almost always called for. The word not is also a word that's not heard a lot on the ship. Uh, but for the interest of you know, just keeping things simple, I'm going to continue to say tie and not because we don't need to get into it. Okay. So all these lines are there to support the mass and control the sails. Much of a sailor's time was spent up in the rigging. During normal maintenance, uh, you replace a worn and damaged rope, right? Rope gets damaged one way or another, gets chafed, gets anything could happen to it. You see something like this, you fix it immediately. Uh, it tends to the sails. Anything, same thing, worn, torn. Uh, anything that needs to be fixed is fixed immediately. Uh, in the rigging and on deck, everything has to be kept nice and neat, constantly ready to be used. And nothing, you see, nothing's just laying around. There's nothing sloppy about this. It's all bit ready to be used right now. Ship is kept clean and orderly. Uh, you learn the ropes, right? You've heard that term, learn the ropes. What's it made out of? What? The rope. Uh, early on it was hemp, then manila came in later. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much the, the majority of it. Uh, there's, as far as that goes, hemp compared to manila, Hemp is way nicer to work with. Manila is hard on your hands, and it's just kind of nasty. Hemp is just a wonderful product to use. But anyways. Uh, so yeah, the new sailors, the young kid, learning from the old guy. That guy's repairing a sail. This goes on constantly. Uh, so there are a lot of knots, and all of them have to be tied exactly right. Here's another quote from the Ashley Book of Knots. He says, A knot is never nearly right. It is either exactly right or it is hopelessly wrong. <laughs> it's one or the other. There's nothing in between. This is not the impossibly high standard of the, of the idealist. It is a mere fact for the realist to face. In a knot of eight crossings, which is about the average size knot, there are 256 different over and under arrangements possible. Make only one change in this over and under sequence, and either an entirely different knot is made, or no knot at all may result. That makes it sound a lot harder than it is, but it is true that it all has to be tied exactly right. There's nothing in between about it. So it's important, because an improperly tied knot can mean death or injury, right? So here's a guy up in the rig. He may be 10 feet off the deck or he may be 80 feet off the deck, you know? He's uh, supported completely by lines that he didn't necessarily make, right? He didn't make those connections. He's up there trusting his life on his shipmate's work, right? Somebody else did this, but he doesn't care. He's up there and he's hanging from it. And he's, he's risking his life right on that. And he could do this with confidence because of one simple fact, is that sailors did not tolerate sloppy or careless work. Did absolutely not tolerate it. And it was a very, very important part of their lives. If you tie an improper knot, a sloppy knot, you leave a rope end to unravel, or improperly coil a line so that it tangles when you let it out, and you will definitely be punished by your shipmates. It won't take very long for them to find out who did it, right? And you wouldn't want to be that guy, right? So it was important. 
Uh, perfection was the goal, maybe not always attained, uh, but it was still strived for by all able-bodied seamen. He may hit, hate the ship's officers, you know, despise this old rotten hull, be malnourished and thirsty, but the rigging will be as perfect as he can make it because it's the one thing he can control. Uh, there were well-known systems of and combinations of knots used for every line on the ship. These combinations or individual knots were never mixed up or switched around. Uh, it's in, also interesting that this system of rigging ships was international in the Western world. Asian is a whole, they developed completely differently, but in the West, all the Western European and American ships were rigged virtually the same. Going back to that picture earlier, you have a mixed nationalities, lots of different people, all different uh, nationalities, different languages. You can't, and this, this happens constantly, every time a ship pulled into a port, a few people would change. You can't train everybody over again on a different system. And so over years, they all became the same. Uh, in the rigging, you had to be you had to be able to blindly put your hand on the right knot, undo it, adjust it, and retie it easily and quickly. It wasn't up to the sailors, individual sailors, to decide what knot he's doing. He's working on something, and he's gonna oh I'm gonna do I'm gonna do something different here just for the heck of it, show how much I know. Uh uh. All has to be everybody does everything exactly the same. Uh, it wasn't up to the sailor to decide which was best or do something tricky. Not in the rigging. Uh, so throughout the voyage, damaged frayed rope was replaced, repaired as needed. They wanted every line and every connection, all the sails, to be in perfect condition at all times. The British Navy taught their sailors that everything near you that was incorrect was your responsibility. That's a pretty broad statement. You know, any, you walk by something and it's not correct, you are responsible for it. Whether you did it or not, it doesn't matter. You're near it. Uh, here's another book. Uh, it's called The Art of Rigging by George Biddlecombe. This is from about 1850. And it's a compilation from another work by a man named Steele, I don't know his first name, who wrote a book on, on seamanship, uh, was published in, I believe, 1794. So there's a lot of old information, which I really love. So a quote from uh, The Art of Rigging. It says, it was a great work to mast and rig a full rigged ship when all was done by hand. But it was a small matter when compared with the work and care and maintenance required to make each rope, spar, and canvas do its work and live its life. No baby was swaddled with greater care than that bestowed on shrouds and backstays by the mariners when paying, parceling, worming, and serving. So they were serious about this, right? Why? Why is that so important? Well, it's because the sun doesn't always shine, right? It's not always, you know, nice winds and, and calm seas. You know, you get uh, high winds, the waves, rain, the ships rocking back and forth. And maybe it's uh, 2 o'clock in the morning and no moon, right? So what do you do? Well, I know what I would do. Given the choice, go down below and ride this out. I don't know. I think this is I, I think this is a French ship, uh, but I can't be sure. But they were they were definitely more cultured than us than the rest of the Europe. Yeah. So if you couldn't get there, you'd probably end up here. I love this picture. I mean, this is this is these guys are. <laughs> <laughs> That's nuts. So imagine the motion. The mat, you know, they're over the water now, but then they go over the deck and then over the water. And over the deck and over the water, and they're back and forth. But the thing is, someone's got to do it. The sails have to be furled properly. In a high wind, the sail comes loose. What happens? 
<laughs> everything bad. Everything bad that you can imagine happens. Uh, well, way worse than that is re rigging the rigging and yes. finding a new cell after you just lost the cell. Right, yeah. Well, they want to protect this stuff by all means. So this is why when it, during fair weather and regular maintenance, everything has got to be perfect just for this occasion, right? You don't want to warn rope breaking under these circumstances, right? That rope they're yanking on, they're putting one heck of a lot of stress on this thing. Plus, the, the, just the, the wind on the mass and the ring puts enormous stress on these lines. And so you want to make sure that if they break, they're going to break with the sun shining and it's nice. You know, because if that breaks, somebody's going up there to fix it. You can't just leave it and say, oh, we'll take care of that tomorrow. Uh, everything on deck has to be tied down. Right? Below decks, everything has to be tied down. Things can get nasty, right? So imagine doing all of this with one hand. Because your other hand's holding on for dear life, right? So you've got. So you want to make sure that this is done beforehand. Uh, so yeah, in an emergency, in the dark, dripping wet, with one hand, you can't afford to fumble around and figure out how some other guy tied this up. Uh, what, oh, geez, what did he do? How, how's this tight? You know, no. You want to know. You want to, be able to put your hand on that. And know exactly what it is. Exactly how to deal with it. <clears throat> Of course, that's not the only danger in the high seas. Obviously, there's other stuff going on. But uh, that's, a, I think, a different lecture. I think that's, that's already happened, hasn't it? So, as I mentioned, uh, the, the first known sails on a ship came about 7,500 years ago. That's 75 centuries of innovation and improvements in the rigging of ships. Uh, by 19th century, uh, the science of rigging was very highly developed, uh, limited only by the available materials. Uh, the technology of rigging saw very little change in the last 200 years up until, say, 1850, when steel cables came in, steam power started coming up. Uh, the art of sailing, or rather, the art of not tying started dropping off as, as was not needed as much. And that's, and it's gone downhill kind of since then. There's, there are pockets of people that, that uh, try to revive it and keep it alive, and I think it's really important to do so. Uh, but that's what happened. Uh, so what makes a good knot? So now we're talking about knots. What makes a good knot? Well, a knot has to be fit for the purpose, has to do what you want it to do, it has to be easy to tie, it has to be easy to untie, because rope is expensive and it's a limited uh, commodity on a ship. So you didn't cut the end off if you couldn't get that knot untied. You didn't just hack it off and start over. You wanted knots, excuse me, you wanted knots that you could easily untie, continue to use that rope without shortening it. A knot has to stay tied until you untie it, right? Obviously. And of course, it has to be tied properly. So all this uh, shipboard rope work we're talking about so far uh, comes under the heading of Marlin Spike Seamanship. Uh, these are some of my tools. Uh, many of them are handmade. Uh, oops, no, nope, went the wrong way. Here we go. You all see that laser? Okay. So what we've got here are are two fids. A fid is all wood, used mainly for splicing. We have a marlin spike. This is my very first marlin spike, uh, made for me by a friend of mine who was in the Navy Reserve. The, it's all metal. We have the fids are all wood. Uh, Marlin spikes all metal. This contraption here is has a wooden handle and a metal tip. That's called a pricker. Another Marlin spike in the sheath, a knife, and a mallet. Mallet doesn't really need to be in this picture, but it just happened to be. So 
These are tools that a sailor would take. <laughs> take away the mallet. These are tools that a sailor would take into the rigging to do his job. It's not a lot. It's not a big toolkit uh, that they carried with them. You notice that some of them are decorated with nuts. That knot right there, I tied 45 years ago. Uh, and this one's a lot newer. But anyways, so knots are decoration. All right? So now I'm going to talk to you briefly about what's called decorative marlin spike seamanship. And this is a folk art that was developed mainly by sailors on the wooden ships. It was developed over hundreds of years and perfected. It was the deep water sailors that developed the art of, of knot tying or decorative knot tying and really put tons and tons of innovations into the subject. Uh, their length of time at sea was so long and the inability to read and write was just an incredible hardship and you know, it would drive them nuts or went nuts from boredom. They didn't have a lot of spare time, but the spare time they had, they had to keep their minds occupied. And the best way to do that was to keep their hands occupied. And so they they did a lot of different things. They made jackknives, they knitted, they sewed, uh, they made baskets and straw hats. Uh, aboard the whalers, of course, there was scrimshaw, a number of different arts. But most of them were apt to do deck, do not work because aboard ship there was a lot of rope. There was a lot of rope hanging around. Oh, I should have put that up earlier. This is a needle case. I just got this off the interwebs. I thought it was really pretty, so I threw it up there. But this gives you an example of what they would do, type of things they would do. And the reason they did it is because there was lots and lots of rope on board ship, and a lot of it would get condemned. And that would be made available to the sailors so that they wouldn't go nuts. Uh, so rope that had to be repaired, or rather replaced due to wear and all that sort of thing, would be... Uh, you know, provided to them, and and the whalers had had it the best because they had, uh, they were longer voyages. They were generally overmanned, uh, so they had more free time, and they had a lot of uh, what they called the whale the whale line, which was the absolute best quality hemp available at the time. It was beautiful stuff, evidently. Uh, So decorative work isn't just pretty to look at, it also serves a function, almost always serves a function. This bell rope, uh, oops. if you wanted to take a closer look at it, it's this one right here. And you can take a look at that. But seriously, an old piece of rope would work just as fine if you just want to ring the bell, right? But if you can make something really nice, you know, that's even better, isn't it? Uh, mats of all kinds and complexities were used uh, as footholds uh, and to protect surfaces from wear. Uh, various coverings were used as handholds. This is going up a, a ladder. Uh, protect surfaces, use as handles, stuff like that. Manage if... if uh, if it was nice to look at, if it was pretty, you know, maybe even beautiful. Uh, if that's, you know, that to me is, it's just really cool looking, so I hope it is to a lot of you. Uh, so here's another quote from The Art of Rigging, George Biddlecombe, where he says, The fancy work done on board ships known as flash packets was a delight to the sailor's eye. Uh, there, every rope's end was pointed instead of the usual twine whipping. No shore craftsman ever put more into his job than did the old-time mariner when splicing a rope, sticking a cringle, or doing any of the hundred and many other jobs of sailoring. And when it came to the art, to the, uh, when it came to the decorating rope or canvas, he was an artist of the deep waters. So over time, the interest in knots became intense, right? It became competitive. 
uh, complex knots were only shown under if you swore to secrecy. All right? Seriously, uh, it was used as as um, currency. You know, if I know a knot that you want to learn, right? Well, I've got something. You know, what are you going to give me? All right? It goes back and forth. Ashley talks about a guy. Uh, who didn't finish his the lanyard on his sa on his sea bag uh, for two years because he'd seen this knot that he wanted to finish it with, but he didn't know how to tie it. It took him two years going from ship to ship till he finally found somebody that knew how to tie it and would show him, and then he finished his bag. So it was important to these guys. It was a big deal. Uh, Sailors were judged by the quality of their knotted handles on their sea chests and the, uh, and the bag lanyard. And again, the only way to learn is just looking over somebody's shoulder. It's an up-close thing. There were no books. Again, they were, they were illiterate. They only learned by watching somebody else. Uh, so as you look around the museum, especially down in the gallery, uh, when you look at the paintings, you know, look into the rigging. And there are not a lot of them, but a few of the paintings actually depict the sailors in the rigging. Right? And I hope that you have a better kind of a sense that these guys just weren't guys. Like, in the, like on TV, they were just kind of unruly mob. These were highly skilled guys, and many of them were artists every bit as much as the guy who painted them up there in the, in the rigging. So, let's say you were foolish enough to try and learn this today. Uh, so books on knots early on were very scarce. My oldest book that touch, that it just touches on knotting uh, was from was first published in 1808, uh, and this was meant for young officers. In fact, it was called the Young Officers Sheet Anchor by Darcy Lever, uh, and he doesn't really talk a lot about knots specifically. He's talking mainly, as I mentioned earlier, new officers, new young officers that would know that walk on a ship and know what they were looking at, more or less. Uh, there were and, very, and still are very few comprehensive books on the subject. The Ashley Book of Knots is one, uh, probably the best. There's another one. It's called the Encyclopedia of Knots. Do not remember the name of the guy who wrote it. Raoul something. You know, it doesn't matter. One of the French guys. Yeah, one of the French guys. Uh, but like, those are the only two really comprehensive books that I'm aware of. <clears throat> There's a lot of other books out there, and uh, you know that will teach you some of the author's favorite knots or things they think you should know. And some of them are very, very good. Some of them aren't. We have a collection of books that cover knotting in the library. It's a very good collection. Uh, if you want to start there, it's a really good place. I learned from Ashley and followed his diagrams for years, so that's you know kind of what I like. But aside from just learning the knots, you also have to find good quality material. Uh, now, when I was a kid, I had access to one thing, and that was a local hardware store. And so, and I developed a habit that I still have. Whenever I go to a hardware store, I always go to the section where they have the rope and the string and stuff like that and see what do they got. They got anything here that I've never seen before. And sometimes I buy it. Mostly I'm familiar with it. But it, it's, it's a bit of a thing to try and find good material. Uh, you, of course, will be... Uh, Inundated by people who want to sell you paracord, that's parachute cord, right? <laughs> and Vicky's laughing. That's good. Um, which is fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, you know, it comes in a bunch of different colors. It's cheap enough. Uh, it, you know, it's fine. You know, just just the uh, it's readily available. And almost all videos on the interwebs will show knots being tied with paracord. So if you want to learn from video, paracord is a good place to start. It's available everywhere, whether it be Walmart, uh, 
any, any you name it, uh, any hardware store you go to, everybody's going to have paracord in six different colors. And if you go on the interwebs, you'll find 9,000 colors. So that's good. Uh, but I would just say, don't stop there. Get yourself some good hard laid cotton, maybe a little bit of hemp, and you'll start to see how really cool this can be. Uh, so I learned by trial and error, uh, strictly, because there was nothing, I had no examples to go by, and that's fine. But lately what I've done is I've started doing classes, and I just realized I was going to have a uh, clipboard up here, and I didn't do it. So what I'll do, clipboard and a piece of paper, that would be really cool, thank you. I'll put it up here, and if anybody thinks you might possibly be interested in, in learning something about this, put your name, email on it, and when I do the next class, which probably won't be until the first of the year, after the first of the year, then what I do is I send an email out to everyone all at once. The first five who respond are in. Okay, and that's the only fair way I can do it, and no more than five. We had I did eight one time, and it was too many. The reason being, again, everything's up close. So five people, you get a nice tight circle. Everybody can see. I can see what everybody's doing. You expand that circle, and everybody gets farther away, and it's just much more difficult. Uh, so. Uh, you're welcome to do that. I'd love to see you guys do it. And we'll, we'll do not just one, but we'll do several classes and uh, over time. So you'll have a chance, hopefully, to do that if you want to. And that is the conclusion of my talk. So. Thanks. So I'll take any questions.